So hello, my name's Julian Savalescu. For those of you who don't know me, the uh, Director of the Centre for Biomedical mm. Ethics, uh, the Yonglu Lin School of Medicine. It's a great pleasure to, to welcome you to this afternoon's talk by uh, Professor Steve Joffe. Um, he's a paediatric oncologist and bioethicist. He's currently the Art and Eileen Penn Professor of Medical Ethics and Health Policy, uh, the Chair of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy, and Professor of Paediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. He's also Director of the Penn Postdoctoral Training Program in Ethical, Legal and Social Implications of it, Genetics and Genomics and co-director of the Cancer Control Program within the Ab Abramson Cancer Centre. So, extremely busy man. So we, we're very privileged that he's been able to, to squeeze in a visit to us. His research interests address the many challenges that arise from the conduct of clinical and translational investigation. His talk today is very much aligned with this interest and he'll be talking on the topic of research infrastructures as quality improvement interventions. Steve, over to you. Great. Julian, thank you so much, and uh, thanks to Mikey Dunn uh, and to the team for inviting me and, and uh, having me out here to give a talk. It's my first visit to Singapore, and it's really been a, a treat uh, to be here. And thanks also to all of you uh, who've joined for uh, this session. Um, as Julian said, I'm going to talk about research infrastructures, thinking about them in addition to the fact that you'll learn something from the research and the trials that you do, uh, as ways of intervening to improve the quality of healthcare that we deliver. And I'll make that thesis more clear um, in a moment. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to start, as uh, also Julian mentioned, I'm a pediatric oncologist. I haven't practiced in a few years, but I uh, trained and worked for 20 years as a children's cancer doctor and a, a pediatric oncologist. And I'll talk a bit about the, the lessons of pediatric oncology with a kind of a US focus, um, but really a, a, the global lessons for what can happen when you build uh, research infrastructures. And I'm going to try to build on that uh, to talk about how research infrastructures, and I will explain what I mean by research infrastructures, uh, hold for improving the quality of healthcare more broadly. Again, in addition to what you learn from the actual research, uh, the research that you run, the hypotheses that you test, the trials that you run. So here, here's uh, my statement of the hypothesis, and then I'll try to back it up uh, over the course of the rest of the talk. Um, I want to hypothesize, and I will um, sort of try to make clear that the, the evidence for this uh, is, I think, strong, but still circumstantial. It's not um, definitive evidence, but I think it, uh, hopefully I can provoke you to um, at least consider it, that research infrastructures can play a quality improvement uh, function, uh, not just by virtue of what you learn, but also, and not just for the patients on the trials, but also for all patients who are getting the care in places that do a lot of research. And, and the mechanisms for that, which I'll go into uh, more, are that when you protocolize care, when you, when you uh, do your care according to protocols, as we do in clinical trials, um, that creates a culture of adherence uh, to evidence-based standards of care, that that effect spills over not into the, um, the intervention that you're doing for the particular disease, but also to ancillary and supportive care that patients get, so beyond the actual um, trials and that there are also effects on uh, collaboration within professions, let's say the profession of medicine, but also between professions, so including nursing and social work and other things, uh, the entire clinical community, um, the education that clinicians get by virtue of being involved in research, and a culture of accountability uh, for quality that I think has benefits uh, for all. And I also am going to further suggest that this has the particular potential for benefits uh, in low and middle income countries. Although the lessons that I'll start with come from high income countries like the US. So what do I mean by pediatric oncology uh, having some lessons for us? Um, well, my, my field of pediatric oncology, uh, I really think has created a kind of model research infrastructure. And um, this paper, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, a very important paper in the history of research ethics about uh, 10 years ago now, um, uh, tries to uh, support the claim or, or makes a nice statement of the claim that I'm about to make. Um, so in this paper by mostly uh, folks from Johns Hopkins University in the United States, they argued that if we try to make a very clear uh, distinction between research 
uh, and clinical care that, that doesn't really reflect a lot of the way that uh, research and clinical care are integrated today. And they use pediatric oncology as a model for this. So here I'm quoting from their paper. Uh, Consider the example of pediatric oncology in which virtually all patients, now again, they're thinking about the United States here, um, virtually all patients are enrolled in clinical trials and enrollment in trials is considered to be a standard of care. Now, this is actually not quite right anymore. It's not quite true that virtually all patients, but it's probably 50 or 60 percent. And I actually have spent a chunk of my career arguing that we have to be careful saying that being in a clinical trial is the standard of care and that that's, a, that's kind of a mistake to make that claim. But nonetheless, this is how my colleagues um, start their talk or their, or their paper. Um, they go on to say the practice construct practice context is constructed to bring the most pertinent forms of scientific understanding to bear on clinical care, and clinical care generates new scientific learning. So research and learning and clinical care in the model of pediatric oncology that they talk about are really very closely aligned. And finally, and this is the most uh, important part of their quote, I think, generating and using generalizable knowledge, and generalizable knowledge or the pursuit of generalizable knowledge is, is one way that we can talk about research or define research, can be a deliberate and integrated aspect or part of practice, not a set of maneuvers logically distinct from it. So in pediatric oncology, because so much of the practice involves enrolling patients in clinical trials, and uh, that almost becomes routine, almost routine, not entirely, but almost routine, um, the boundary between clinical care and research gets blurred. That has its dangers, we'll talk about, but it also has its uh, advantages. So when I talk about pediatric oncology in the United States, most of you are probably not familiar with the children's oncology group, but this is the infrastructure that really creates the basis for pediatric oncology research. Uh, and I just want to point out this quote. Uh, more than, oh, I did not mean to do that. Let's see what, uh, um, point out this quote. More than 90% of the children and adolescents diagnosed with cancer each year in the United States are cared for at a children's oncology group member institution. Doesn't say that they're enrolled in trials at those institutions, but they are cared for at institutions that offer and participate in trials, and that's the important uh, point. Now, this costs money to build a trials infrastructure like pediatric oncology. In the United States, uh, these days, the National Cancer Institute's part of the National Institutes of Health uh, spends about $25 million a year to create the infrastructure to be able to run these clinical trials across about 200 member institutions. There's a bunch of different grants, two major grants that fund the infrastructure, one for the actual running of the trials and one for the statistics and data center. And then there's all these other smaller grants to do some of the basic science and translational science, the biospecimen repository, uh, and psychosocial research and other things like that. And then, of course, investigators who are involved with the group will go out and get their own grants from the National Cancer Institute and other places. It is an international enterprise. Most of the sites are in the United States and Canada, but as you'll see, there are a number of them in uh, Australia and New Zealand. There's actually one in Saudi Arabia. Previously, there were several sites in the Netherlands, but those have since closed. So it's not just a North American or US institution. And the important part about it is that um, it affects the experience and care of kids diagnosed with cancer, both because if a kid at a children's oncology group institution is uh, eligible for one of the studies, they might be in invited to enroll or their parents might be invited to enroll them on a biology study to understand more about the biology of cancer, on a classic clinical trial to test or uh, newer improved interventions, drugs or other things to try to improve the treatment of cancer, supportive care studies to reduce, let's say, infection rates or reduce pain or other complications, studies of psychosocial outcomes because, of course, being diagnosed with cancer is a psychosocially very devastating or challenging event, and then a registry so that even if you're not in any of these trials, you can be entered into a registry for the possibility of being involved in research in the future or contacted for research in the future. An important point is, um, I want to show you how the outcomes of children's cancer in the United States, and this is mirrored in uh, many other, most other high-income countries, have really changed over the last few decades. So uh, the first thing to point out, I'll have you focus on the black line here. Uh, this is mortality measures as de deaths per 100,000 children 
over the course of the past, what's that, 50 or so years since 1975. And you can see that the number of deaths per 100,000 kids has declined markedly from more than five per 100,000 in 1975 to the latest data that I've seen is from about 2010 to just over two. Now, I don't wanna argue that all of that is due to the research that's been done through groups like the Children's Oncology Group, but I think that the groups have made a very major difference by virtue not only of the research that they've run, but also the sort of quality of care that has happened or that uh, they have facilitated at the institutions that participate in the research. Here's some more um, curves. These are survival curves. And so these were kids diagnosed with leukemia in 1968 to 1970, obviously a long time ago. And you can see that at that time, it was basically a non-survivable uh, disease. This is the three-year mark and almost every kid had died by three years. But by the time we get to even like the 1990s, survivals are up to 90% or better. And today, survival of the most common p uh, pediatric leukemia, lymphoblastic leukemia, is up over 95%. Now, the question I want you to be thinking about is how might this kind of a research infrastructure or a, a, a network like this, what, how might it actually have these kinds of effects on improving care? And the most obvious answer might be, well, they do clinical trials, they figure out which drugs or drug combinations or other treatments work better to improve outcomes, and then those become the standard of care, and that's the way that uh, clinical trials infrastructure improves uh, outcomes. And I have no doubt that that is part of the answer, and, uh, and that's the sort of first and foremost reason why we do clinical research. There's also been an argument, and this I'm gonna be skeptical about, and I'll show you why in a moment, um, that just by being on a trial, the likelihood is that your outcomes would be better, you have a better chance of survival or whatever kind of outcome we're talking about, than if you weren't on a trial, if you were treated outside of a trial. And this has been called the trial effect. And um, so that hypothesis has been put out there and it's actually very common in uh, the cancer world, not just pediatric oncology, but cancer in general. I'll show you some quotes. And so if you're in a field where 50 or 60 or 70% of patients are treated on trials and just being in a trial is good for your outcomes, then maybe that's part of the reason why we've seen such improvement in outcomes. So this idea of a trial effect is widely endorsed. Lots of people will point to it in cancer medicine. I actually made some enemies early on in my uh, career in pediatric oncology about 15 years ago by basically publishing some articles that said, I don't believe this and here's the reasons why I'm skeptical that there's a trial effect or at least that the data do not support that there's a trial effect yet. So um, this is from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is an organization in the United States that sets standards for how you should treat people with various types of cancer. So a very authoritative organization uh, that publishes guidelines on the treatment of all different kinds of cancer. And in every one of their guidelines, they have this statement, we believe that the best management for any patient with cancer is in a clinical trial. Participation in clinical trials is especially encouraged. And this is a statement that they believe that there's a trial effect, that you're better off being in a trial um, than not being in a trial. Now again, I said so I made some enemies early on in my career by um, basically arguing that we did not yet have the evidence to be able to make a strong claim like this. So here are some examples of why I don't think the evidence is there yet. This is a Cochrane collaboration. Some of you may be familiar with this group. They do systematic reviews and meta-analysis to try to get all of the evidence together for whether a particular, like say, drug is effective or how to treat something. And in this case, the Cochrane group did a systematic review and meta-analysis to try to answer this question, is there a trial effect? Is there a benefit just of being on trials? And without showing you the very technical graphs from the paper, they concluded that they could not find evidence of a trial effect. So this review indicates that participation in RCTs, randomized controlled trials, is associated with similar outcomes to receiving the same out the treatment outside of RCTs. These results challenge the assertion that the results of RCTs are not applicable to usual practice, but they also challenge the assertion that being in an RCT is better for you than not being in, R in an RCT. So they could not find evidence to support or consistent and strong evidence to support that there was a, just a net benefit to being in trials. Some more um, papers just from the um, uh, oncology literature, this from uh, colleagues at the Seattle Children's Hospital, looking at children over a period of time 
all of whom were treated for acute lymphoblastic leukemia at this very excellent uh, children's hospital in Seattle in the United States. And here are the survival curves. And uh, I can't even tell which is the non-participants and which is the participants, but basically these survival curves look the same, right? I think the blue may be the non-participants. Hard to see that there's a benefit from being in a trial compared to not being in a trial if you are treated at a place that is as excellent as Seattle Children's Hospital. This is a, a different type of uh, leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia. This is a population-based study from Canada. And they similarly concluded that uh, there is no definitive uh, better survival if you are treated. This, this is a disease with a worse prognosis out overall than acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is why these survival curves don't look as good. But you can see that here on the, um, in the blue curve, these are the kids who are enrolled in trials, the red curve, kids who are not enrolled in trials. Hard to see much of a convincing difference uh, there. Now, there is some evidence to support that uh, you, you can find papers to support that there might be some improvement. So this is that same group from Canada looking at the other type of leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And here are their survival curves. And you can see that the enrolled kids, which is the dotted or dashed line, they're doing a little bit better. And actually, with a disease with a survival this good, that's a meaningful difference. Now, whether this is caused by being in a trial or some other thing is hard to know. But I just want to be sort of honest with you that there is mixed evidence for whether or not you're better off in a trial. So, so far we've talked about two of the three potential hypotheses for why, or two of the potential ways in which having a research infrastructure in place might be good for the quality, good for patient outcomes in general. The possibility and the reality that you'll learn things in clinical trials, you'll learn what works and what doesn't, and you take the things that work and you move them forward and put them into standard care, and that's the first one. The second one, which is, is there a trial effect? Is there just a benefit of being on trials? And there I've tried to convince you that the evidence is somewhat equivocal. And finally, wh where I really want to go with this presentation is the potential benefits of just having a research infrastructure in place in your clinic, in your hospital, in your institution, in your country. Uh, and, th and that that infrastructure may have benefits not only for the patients on the trials, but also all patients who are treated at the place that do uh, research and that participate in trials and that are members of the infrastructure. So some ways in which having an infrastructure might be good, not just for patients in the future because of things that you learn from your research, but for current patients who are treated at the institutions that do research. Well, one is, and I hinted at some of these earlier, the possibility of creating a culture of evidence-based medicine. So this quote, actually early on, I told you that I made some enemies by um, uh, sort of taking on some of the sort of uh, assumptions in oncology, like the idea that people do better in trials than not doing better, than, um, not doing, uh, than if they don't join trials. And in response, these, this was a letter from some leaders in the world of pediatric oncology in response to a paper we published, where they wrote, the state of the art treatment for a child with cancer derives from the best therapy identified in prior clinical trials. I think that's an excellent statement. The standard arms of clinical research protocols serve as de facto uh, practice guidelines, and newly diagnosed children can receive the state of the art standard therapy whether or not they enroll in a clinical research trial. So that protocol has the description of what is considered the standard therapy. It's the control arm of the clinical trial. And any child, whether or not they enroll in the trial, or even if they don't enroll in the trial, has access to that standard therapy, which is written down in the protocol for everybody to see and to uh, abide by and to follow. Second is, if you're a clinician, uh, and you are involved in the care of patients in a place where there's a kind of a research infrastructure and a culture of doing clinical trials. You are involved in education. You're involved in reading materials about those trials. Um, you're involved in sort of knowing where standards of care are today. It keeps you up to date. And so trial protocols, if you're reading them or if they're being used around you, will double as educational interventions. They also ra raise standards of practice across the board. If anybody's been involved in clinical research, clinical trials, you know that there's a lot of monitoring, a lot of making sure that people are adhering to the treatments that are uh, used in the clinical trial. And there's an expectation of 
following the protocol and somebody sort of checking up on you to make sure that the research is being done right because that's necessary for the validity of the science. So that kind of uh, culture of adherence to protocols and to treatment plans even outside of a protocols is another byproduct of the fact that clinical trials are being run. Trials infrastructures mean that people are talking to each other, both within any given discipline, like the discipline of medicine or the discipline of nursing, but also across disciplines, something that doesn't always happen otherwise. Done right, they can also bring patients and families and communities into the conversation about what trials are appropriate, how can we run trials that the community or the patients are happy with, how can we make our trial experience better, so we can engage patients as advocates uh, for our care uh, and really as teachers for us. So those are some of the pathways. What about the evidence? What is, what's the evidence that there's an infrastructure effect or what I'm going to call an infrastructure effect? So again, just like with the trial effect uh, literature, I'm going to be sort of uh, clear here that I don't think that the evidence is conclusive one way or the other but I do think that there is circumstantial evidence to support the hypotheses that I've um, put forward. So this one, um, this is now from a cardiovascular uh, study. This was being run in the, um, U in the United Kingdom, in the UK, where Majumdaran studies and colleagues studied adherence to guidelines and mortality among over 170,000 patients with a kind of um, coronary syndrome or a kind of um, what, what unstable angina, threatened um, cardiac, uh, threatened heart attacks, uh, who were treated at almost 500 hospitals who were taking part in something called the Crusade Initiative, not the best chosen name, um, but this, is the, this was the name of the initiative that they were par taking part in. And so the question that um, they asked was, at the ho if we look at the hospitals, some of them, they're taking part in this initiative to understand better how these patients are treated, but not all of them are doing uh, clinical trials and enrolling patients at a high level within clinical trials. So they divided their hospitals into three groups. Those that, that were basically enrolling no patients in clinical trials, that were enrolling some patients but a relatively low number and that was a median of 1%. And those that were enrolling a, a high number for their study in trials which was a median of about 5%. So we're not talking about 30 or 50 or 100% of the patients enrolling in trials. These are still small numbers but some of them were much more active in research than others. So, and the thing I want you to notice is that the in-hospital mortality of patients who were admitted with this coronary syndrome was quite a bit lower in the high enrollment group. It was what, about three and a half percent, something like that, than in the no enrollment group, 6%, with the low enrollment group, the 1% group, being somewhere in the middle. So a suggestion that doing a lot of research or enrolling more of your patients in research is associated, and I want to be careful about claiming that this is causal, but it's associated with better outcomes for your patients, in this case, a mortality that's about half. Second, um, this one is uh, more of a, almost like a natural experiment. This is multiple myeloma, a kind of blood cancer for uh, mostly ad older adults, and uh, these investigators, and this was a paper published quite a while ago, 1989, looked at what happened when a research infrastructure for multiple myeloma was put in place in some regions of Finland but not others. Right? So some parts of Finland got this new research infrastructure, others didn't. So clinical trials program was initiated across most but not all areas of Finland in 1979. And the investigators looked at survival between these areas both before and after this infrastructure was put in place. So this is before, this is before the infrastructure was put in place. And I want you to notice that the participating, the patients in the participating areas, there were 948 uh, patients, that's the blue bar, and their five-year survival was um, probably 25%, something like that. The non-participating region, if anything, their five-year survival was a little bit better, about 30%. This is before the infrastructure was put in place. After the infrastructure, the participating region, their outcomes got a lot better. So now their outcomes are up to close to 40% uh, five-year survival, whereas basically the non-participating region outcomes didn't change. So it seems like putting in place this infrastructure to 
um, do clinical trials for multiple myeloma in Finland was associated, again, I want to be careful about claiming causation, but was associated with improved outcomes in the areas that were participating, but not in the areas that were not. And um, the important thing to know here is that not all of these patients were participating in trials. So of these uh, 405 patients here, it's not that all 405 were participating in trials, a subset of them were. This is a systematic review that was published in 2011. And um, they looked at if, if your healthcare practitioner, your doctor, or the institution where you get your healthcare is participating in clinical trials compared with if they're not, are there better outcomes if they are participating in the clinical trials? The, the data from this, they're hard to present in a sort of uh, summary form, um, but what they did was they did a meta-analysis of two experimental studies and 11 cohort studies. This was all they could find uh, in the literature to compare outcomes among patients uh, who are treated by clinicians or institutions that do research compared to patients treated by clinicians or institutions that don't do research. And to summarize their conclusions, and by the way, that Majumdar study uh, that I mentioned, that uh, uh, heart attack study was one of the uh, 11, I think, of the cohort studies. So they concluded the available findings from existing research suggest that there might be a trial effect, and uh, this, uh, in, in the language I'm trying to use, this would be, be better called an infrastructure effect of better outcomes, greater adherence to guidelines, and more use of evidence by practitioners and institutions that take part in trials. That's what I'm claiming, that um, there may be an infrastructure effect. However, the consequences for patient health are uncertain, and the most robust conclusion may be that there's no apparent evidence that patients treated by practitioners or in institutions that take part in trials do worse than those treated elsewhere. So a very cautious conclusion not concluding that there is strong evidence of an infrastructure effect, although hinting that there might be. And then I just want to point out one more recent study, which was published after their systematic review, so couldn't have been included. And this is a study of hospital research participation and colon cancer survival in a population-based study. And these investigators, who are from the UK, uh, analyzed five-year survivals of patients with colon cancer who were treated at UK National Health Service Trusts over an eight-year period of time, 2001 to 2008. And the thing that they looked at is the trusts were divided up depending upon how much, what percentage of their patients were participating in trials for colorectal cancer. So that was the independent variable. Did you have a low participation rate of your patients in trials or a higher participation rate? And the graph that I want you to focus on or the line that I want you to focus on is the red line this is the hazard ratio, which is a measure of relative survival, five-year survival. And you can see that as the percent of research participation of the trust or the hospital increased, the five years or the, the risk of dying uh, of your colon cancer uh, decreased in a pretty steady and linear fashion. Now, to be fair, these, this is, um, these are small differences, right? This is from a, risk of, a relative risk of one to a relative risk of 0.96 or about a 4% decrease. But given the fact that uh, most of these patients, because they had relatively low stage colon cancer, actually had relatively less, low risk of dying in the first place, the authors conclude that this is actually a pretty big effect, kind of like the effect you would hope to see if you did a clinical trial of a uh, new drug for the most common types of colon cancer, the lower risk types of colon cancer, which is what most patients have. So again, more supportive, circumstantial, suggestive evidence, but again, nothing conclusive uh, of the hypothesis that I'm trying to argue is plausible, if not, uh, uh, certainly not definitive. Now, I started at the beginning, and we just have a few more minutes. I started at the beginning uh, by suggesting that this, this thesis, this hypothesis that I put forward, if it's true, may have particular relevance for low and middle income countries. Now, of course, clinical trials generate knowledge that can drive improvements in care, and that's future-oriented, right? We learn things today that we can take forward for the future. But I've also suggested that clinical trial infrastructures promote collaboration, uh, communication, and standardization around best practices for care. And those are benefits that we can see uh, today and in the near future, and not just in the distant future when we get the answers to our trials. And that this is good for participants as well as for non-participants. Now, 
just uh, briefly touch on the ethical issues. The usual framing of research ethics is, goes something like, when you do clinical trials, when you, when you do research, uh, the patients today accept risks to themselves and sometimes the possibility of benefits to themselves if the drugs that or the things that are being studied uh, turn out to be effective. But they're really accepting risks to themselves today in return for benefits that will accrue to patients in the future because of what we learn uh, from the research. And the usual framing of research ethics, and this is where uh, Ka uh, Nancy Cass and Ruth Faden and the others that I uh, showed you in that Hastings Center report at the beginning, this is where they started, um, is risk today accepted for the possibility of benefits tomorrow. But if there's an infrastructure effect, the framing changes because the benefits of trials or the benefits of having the infrastructure in place accrue not only to patients in the future, but also to patients today. And they accrue not only to the people who participate in the trials, but also to the people who don't. And I think that that changes the risk calculus of how we think about trials, how we think about infrastructures, and almost creates an imperative or an obligation to build infrastructures as one way of improving quality of the care that we deliver. I should also add, it adds a, a case for resource priority setting. If one way that you can improve the quality of care that our patients get is to put in place a research infrastructure that makes a stronger case for devoting resources to putting in place that infrastructure, the case is not just we'll learn things for the future, but we'll actually benefit patients today. So a couple of words of caution. First of all, um, and, and this is particularly true for low and middle income countries, um, to, achieve, to achieve the promise of benefits, uh, research infrastructures must do a number of things. First of all, they must focus on addressing locally relevant health problems. I'm not talking about research infrastructures to go to a low-income country to test things that will only be used in high-income countries. They must be used to focus on things that are locally relevant, health problems that are locally relevant. They need to be aware of the um, local healthcare system and, and local healthcare system capacity and to take advantage of that capacity, but also to build on and uh, seek to improve that local capacity. And they also need to be thinking about a local culture and economic uh, context. They can't be ignoring local cultural factors. And finally, I'm not arguing for abandoning core principles of research ethics like uh, informed consent and attention to risks and benefits of the clinical trials for the patients who take part and things like that. Um, even if there are substantial benefits to patients today, uh, we can't abandon these core principles of research ethics that we spend so much um, uh, uh, sort of thoughtful effort to deliver and put in pl or to develop and put in place. So my take homes, and then I uh, look forward and happily we'll have a little time for discussion, um, is that standard views of research ethics assume that researchers impose risks on today's patients for the, benef for the prospect or potential for benefits for patients in the future. But I'm arguing, and I hope I've convinced you that it's at least plausible and that we should be um, sort of evaluating this possibility. Building infrastructures to conduct research has the potential to improve the quality of care for today's patients, including not just the patients who do take part in the trials, but also those who don't. And that if that's done right, those infrastructures may have particular potential to benefit people in low and, in low and middle income countries. I want to just, uh, before I end, uh, give a shout out and a thank you to a couple of key uh, people who helped me to develop the ideas. Uh, and actually, we published some of this in uh, this paper in the American Journal of Bioethics a few years ago. Uh, Avi Denberg, who's now an assistant professor of pediatrics and bioethics at the University of Toronto, and uh, Carlos Rodriguez Galindo, who's uh, chair of the Department of Global Pediatric Medicine at the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. With that, um, I will um, thank you and look forward to questions and discussion. Thank you.